This is Twit. A few weeks ago, uh, we interviewed Mark Hurstgard from The Nation magazine on the topic of big wireless and its potential cover-up of cell phone radiation research. We heard from a few of you, including Brian, who wrote... Quote, the scientific consensus at this point is that cell phone radio emissions are apparently safe and no evidence uh, has provided a causal or even casual link between non-ionizing radio waves and cancer. Brian asked if we might bring someone onto the show who can speak to the flip side of that discussion. We're happy to do so. He actually recommended today's guest, Christopher Labos, co-host of the Body of Evidence podcast and author of the post titled Cell Phones and Cancer, Random Chance in Clinical Trials over at sciencebasedmedicine.org. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's great to get you on. I'm so happy this, that this worked out. Uh, let's let's kind of begin by taking a look at Brian's assertion, or the, the gentleman who emailed us, uh, that there is no ca casual or causal evidence of such a risk. Prior to the report that was put out in March by the National Toxicology Program, what has research shown as relates to any type of connection between cell phones and cancer? Well, prior to the NTP study actually coming out, the evidence was, I think we'd have to say, somewhat inconsistent. You had some positive studies, some negative studies. But you have to understand that in science, let's say that there was no association between cell phones and cancer. You would normally expect to be a you normally expect there to be a little bit of a spread in the data. You'd have a lot of studies showing no major effect, and then you'd have a few outliers one way or the other. So the data has overall been fairly inconsistent, and I think most people who would look at it would say, well, there's no real conclusive evidence that cell phones cause cancer. And that based on the number of studies that have been done and some fairly large cohort studies that have been done, you'd have to say that if there was a risk, it would probably be very, very small and probably not something that we need to worry about in terms of the public health of the population. So I, I know I was reading through some of your work and, you know, had an interesting piece on organic foods. Um, and, you know, the argument is, oh, you know, for someone to say, well, you know, organic foods are automatically safer for you. And so I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, I could say, well, I'm going to buy them anyway. And the negative to that is, well, they're a lot more expensive and maybe you're wasting your money, you could spend your money in another way. But what about people like after I read this evidence, I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep my uh, phone in my purse or my backpack. I'm not going to keep it on my pocket. I'm going to tell my kids to keep theirs in their backpacks, not in their pockets. I mean, is there anything wrong with just taking those? Like, I know I'm not saying cell phones cause cancer, but just, just doing like small things like that just in case. No, I mean, I don't think there's any harm to carrying your cell phone in your purse as opposed to your pocket or something like that. Where I think there is a danger is when people start trying to sell you products, because there's a lot of people out there who are trying to sell you devices that will shield mm. um, you know, the, uh, the non-ionizing radiation that comes off of your phone. And there there's a harm because first of all, you have to pay money for this and you always have to be a little bit skeptical of somebody who tries to tell you that cell phones cause cancer if they then turn around and try to sell you a product to protect you from cancer because you know, it's, it's the old joke is that if you create the disease, you can then sell the cure. So, you know, I, I don't think there's any particular harm to, you know, like you said, carrying your cell phone in your purse, but you have to be careful about these you know, what's the next step in that argument? Because obviously we're not gonna start throwing away our cell phones. They become so ingrained into our lives that we can't really operate without them. So the, the, the first danger is I think, like I said, the selling of, of inappropriate products. But the second danger is, is that are you creating anxiety in the population? Are you scaring people into thinking that cell phones cause cancer when in fact they actually don't? And you know, there is a harm to the population if we keep putting out these, these warnings that are end up not being true because when there is a real warning that we have to put out there, people are just going to ignore it. And if you want sort of a parallel, what happened in California recently where a drug said that coffee has to, can has to have a, a, a cancer warning, um, which is completely at odds with all the scientific evidence. So the more warnings we put out there, the more people are gonna start to tune them out. And I think there's a real danger in people being saturated with information that is you know, frankly just not entirely true. Yeah, hard to find the the real nuggets through the noise, which I think in this topic is has always been kind of something that I, I you know I even get confused by, and you know my wife and I would have have conversations about this, and it's really hard in this conversation to point to any definitives because there really aren't any, and I think I think we saw a big reaction to the NTP study, which was you know kind of a lot of that reaction both for and against this idea 
kind of seemed to, s to come back, back around to this idea that it was peer reviewed and that during the peer review, certain assertions were elevated to a higher importance after, you know, peers, you know, <laughs> all of these, you know, very, very, um, you know, people who would know the difference between uh, an actual risk and not, they all took a look at this and said, eh, actually, this seems more conclusive than what even the report says. What do you, what do you say about that, that aspect of this report? Yeah, I mean, well, you have to understand something that scientists are at the end of the day, human beings, and they are prone to the same biases that any person is is liable to. And I'm not talking about biases in, in terms of prejudice, I'm talking about biases in terms of how we look at the data. So what was interesting about the NTP study was that, and this was sort of the point that I tried to make in the in the uh, article on science-based medicine that, that you mentioned, was that the, the researchers and the people who did the peer review were not interested really in looking at this idea of could this all have been random chance? They were just sort of looking at the raw data and they said, oh, we see an effect. But they weren't looking into the plausibility of that effect. One of the things you would expect with cell phones is that the more you increase the dose of radio frequency radiation, the more cancer you should get. But we didn't actually see that. So that's a little bit counterintuitive. You would expect that the more of the more RFR, the more radio frequency radiation you give to rats, mice, human beings, the more you should have an increased risk for cancer. Well, that wasn't what the NTP report showed. And so you as a person might say, well, that makes me a little bit more skeptical about the results. Whereas the people reviewing the data, they weren't in looking at that aspect of it. What they were essentially doing was looking at the hazard rather than the risk. And to understand what these two terms mean, the analogy that I always use is, imagine you were to come across a bear. A bear poses a hazard to your safety. A bear can cause you a significant amount of harm. But if you were to come across that bear in a zoo behind a cage, that bear is gonna pose very little risk to you. So a hazard represents the theoretical harm that something can cause you, whereas the risk represents the actual harm. And part of the reason the NTP study was done was to look at the potential hazard of cell phones, not necessarily to examine whether they posed a risk to human beings. And so to illustrate that point, the way the NTP study was done was they took these rats, they took these mice, they exposed them to uh, cell phone radiation, over nine hours of cell phone radiation every day for two years. And so, you know, that's not how most people use their cell phones, right? That's not how I use my cell phone. In fact, I talk on my cell phone very little. I'm using it mainly for texting and, and, and you know, uh, surfing on the internet. So, you know, there, whatever the potential hazard to cell phones might be, the risk that it'll pose to human beings, the way you and I use our cell phones on a daily basis is probably going to be very minimal. But the peer review wasn't concerned with that distinction. They were looking just at the hazard. And so it's important to not accept peer review on blind faith, but to actually understand what was the process going on behind it. Sure. That's really interesting. I mean, that yeah. goes along with the, you know, how dangerous it is really to get in a car um, and, you know, based on the risk versus getting an airplane. And, you know, you you hear right. more about airplane crashes. We're gonna actually talk about um, how risky it is to get in a car in a, a later segment. But my, my, I have a question about longitudinal studies. I mean, it's impossible right. to have one right now. I mean, you can't say, well, you know, this child um, played with a cell phone from age three until age 23. And this is what happened because they just haven't been around as, I guess maybe they've been around that long now. But but what, what, what about longitudinal studies, have there been any of those that we can point to, to that lead us either way? Yeah, there have been a few. There's been the the Danish cohort study. That was what they basically did there was they, what's very interesting about a lot of these European countries is they have national databases. They were able to look at their entire population. Uh, they were able to look at everybody who was diagnosed with a brain tumor over the course of, you know, 20, 25 year span. And they were able to look at mobile phone subscriptions uh, because that information was available to them. So within that national database, they saw that there was in fact no association between uh, having a mobile phone subscription and developing brain cancer. Now, you have to be careful about these type of studies because there's always the possibility of confounding. You can never you know, completely control for all the variables. Maybe the cell phone users and the non-users were different in fundamental ways in terms of you know, what they ate, how much they exercised, stuff like that. But even in these studies that have looked at over 20 years of data, we haven't really seen an association. And also, I mean, I think the most important point, if you're concerned about brain cancer rates, brain cancer rates in you know, both Canada and the US have remained 
you know, fairly stable over the past 20 years. So we're not seeing this uptick that you would expect to see because while cell phones are a relatively new technology, I mean, they have been around now for about 20 years. So if there was a significant effect, we should be starting to see signs of it now and when we're really not doing that. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's what, absolutely one of the questions that I had as far as that was concerned. Was there anything in this particular report or in any of the r- reports that you've seen maybe, uh, you know, surrounding uh, this, but maybe supporting the general thesis, the general uh, point of the NTP study that has challenged your own understanding on this? That's made because uh, I mean, it's it's pretty, pretty obvious your your perspective on this is that yeah. at least based on the evidence that we have right now there is no direct no obvious direct correlation but does does any of the data points from this particular report kind of challenge that in any way for you or do you do you feel like it it just all comes down to chance and it really doesn't sway you well, I, I think initially when I first read the report, I said, oh, well, you know, this is something I have to look into because, of course, like most people, I found out about this by watching the news, right? You saw yeah, the right. news reports and I said, OK, well, I better look into this. And I think few people did what I did, which is go in and, you know, read through the 600 page document that the National Toxicology Program uh, put out because I clearly have a lot of free time on my hands. Um <laughs> But when, you, but when you look at it, one of the things that was interesting was uh, irrespective of the brain cancer link, which was you know only seen in male rats, not in female rats, not in male mice, not in female mice. So I said, okay, well, that's probably a chance finding. I was prepared to write that off. Um, but there was somewhat more evidence for this uh, idea of cardiac schwannomas, these nerve tumor cells found in the heart. And people said, well, because these tumors are histologically similar to acoustic neuromas, that you would see in the brain, maybe this is supportive evidence for this particular type of tumor in the brain. I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Let me take a look at that. Uh, But then I actually went in and looked at the data. And what I found was, yes, there were more cardiac schwannomas, so more of this type of tumor in the heart. But when you looked at throughout the entire body, because these types of nerve tumors can occur anywhere there are nerves, and these nerves are throughout the body. So within the heart, there were more tumors in the rats exposed to cell phones. But when you looked at the total number of tumors throughout the whole body, there wasn't a difference. In fact, there was no association when you looked at the total number of schwannomas. So, you know, when I actually dug into the data, I was said, okay, well, this isn't actually as compelling as I initially thought it was. And, and this is how the scientific process is supposed to work. We get the data, we sift through it, we argue, we debate, we move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually science is going to come to a consensus and you know so far at a certain point if nobody can prove that cell phones are dangerous to some side some type of, of compelling evidence eventually we're going to have to assume that there's probably no effect there because the the thing that most people don't really understand with science is that you can't prove a negative mm-hmm. i can never prove to you that reindeer can't fly even if i took a reindeer to the top of a very tall building and threw him off the building and watched him crash to the ground I haven't proved that reindeer can't fly. I've only proved that that particular reindeer couldn't fly on that particular day. So you'll never be able to prove that cell phones are safe because that's not theoretically possible. You just have to look at all the studies that eventually get done and say, well, if nobody's able to show a conclusive link, we eventually declare that the risk is either non-existent or so small that we can't measure and that it's not something that we need to worry about as a population. So that's sort of how I've been sort of looking at the data on this subject. So we know that people have died when they've been texting and driving and gone in a car accident. Yeah. Um, we know that the more time kids spend on screens, the less time they're outside. Uh, they, you know, the 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 weight, uh, you know, obesity rates in children are going up could be related. Why don't I mean? Why is there so much more news about the whenever there's a, a cell phones cause cancer? Why is there so much more news about that rather than things that we can more easily prove? Well, and I think you've raised some two excellent points. There are some very real harms to cell phones. It's not cancer. It's the fact that if you're texting while you're driving, you're going to get into a car crash. And there are thousands of of car crashes due to distracted driving every year. And, you know, the whole obesity epidemic, we need kids to be outside playing, not sitting home and playing on their phones and playing on their tablets. Those are two very excellent points. But we don't talk about those risks because those are risks that we feel we can control. Human beings are surprisingly bad at gauging risks. And I guess you're gonna get into this when you talk about you know planes and how dangerous they actually are, or, or cars and how dangerous it is to actually drive. People are much more afraid to get into a plane than they are to get into a car, even though getting into a car is a you know, potentially very dangerous thing because we have a lot of car crashes annually. And it's because we feel that we can control that. So because we feel that we can control 
you know, whether we're texting and driving because we feel that we can control, you know, how much our kids are outside playing. We don't seem to see that as a threat, but because we can't control brain cancer, because it's something that seems to be outside of our grasp, it's something we have a lot more difficulty wrapping our heads around and it tends to scare us more. And that's why I think we tend to talk about these issues more instead of talking about some of the really important issues, which is, you know, I think distracted driving is a very important issue and it's something we need to take a lot more seriously. And it's something we don't talk about because, again, it gets back to the fact that we feel that we can control it. So happy to bring you on. Chris Lavos, um, I feel like I've learned a lot more about this um, with you on the show, and that's that's what I was hoping for. So thank you for um, for joining us and kind of shedding light on this perspective. You have a podcast, Body of Evidence. I mentioned it at the beginning of the interview. That can be found at bodyofevidence.ca. Uh, anything else you want to point people to, maybe your Twitter handle or anything online where people can follow you? Oh, yeah. So you can either come to the website or you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Dr. Labos, D-R-L-A-B-O-S, uh, either of those two things. And uh, yeah, come check out the podcast. We tend to tackle topics like this every day and we look at the evidence behind all these uh, you know, uh, various topics. So come, uh, come check us out. Fantastic. Chris, thanks again for joining us and best of luck. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you soon.